Welcome to the Self Principle Podcast with Dr. Sean Hashmi. The Self Principle is a time tested, evidence based approach to optimize your life based on four tenets sleep is medicine, exercise is medicine, love is medicine, and food is medicine. Each week, Dr. Hashmi and his guests dive into the latest research on health, nutrition, fitness, and wellness to help you live your best life. Here's your host, Dr. Sean Hashmi. All right. Well, welcome to our very first interview. So I am so excited. I get the honor, the pleasure, the incredible opportunity to have somebody that I really, really look up to. And it's it's interesting because this individual that you guys are going to get to to hear from today, I have had the just sheer luck to meet her. And ever since I've met her, the more I learn about her, the more I'm just absolutely amazed. So we're, we're delighted. Chef AJ, thank you. This is such an honor for you to be here and uh, to share all of the amazing work you're doing. Now, for some of our audience who may not know a little bit about Chef AJ, what's fascinating about you is you're such a pioneer. I mean, I was just looking at your YouTube channel. You have 112,000 people who are subscribed to the channel, 73,000 on Facebook, 62,000 on Instagram. I went on Amazon and I actually ordered uh, your books because I'm so excited to read them. So what I see there is I see three books that you've done, and I'm really curious to ask you all about them. But what I was really amazed by and impressed by, and you know, I, I, I was uh, watching some of your stuff yesterday and I was so emotional. It was a good thing that I was alone and <laughs> nobody saw me. But I, I, I wanted to, to start off by really asking a little bit about you, your journey, who you are, and and kind of start there. Uh, I'm just, I, I consider myself an OG, you know what they say, like an old gangster vegan, <laughs> because I've been vegan longer than a lot of people have been alive, 43 and a half years. And, you know, what started as an ethical journey, and I'm still an ethical vegan, turned into one really for more about, you know, health, my health, health of the planet. Because when I was 17 in 1977, nobody was talking about global warming, you know, and nobody was talking about, at least nobody I knew was talking about reversing diabetes or heart disease with a plant-based diet. So I went vegan for ethical reasons. And then I found out, guess what? It's good for everything, really, you know, the planet, your own health and so that's kind of what I've dedicated my life to because I I feel like it's really important. If we're going to have a planet, we've got to do something about the state of the world right now. And we've got to either completely eliminate or really cut down on the amount of animals we're eating. You know, it's, it's fascinating. The more research I do into the impact on the environment, it's incredible. And how much pollution actually affects your own health. So I'm specialized in kidney disease, and we're starting to now learn that even air pollution has a significant impact on kidneys. So, so tell me, as you were going through this, you know, what was your journey like? What were some of the obstacles you faced, and and how did you overcome them? Because what I, you know, what what inspires me and fascinates me is this concept of resilience, and some people they have it and others they're like they, they meet the smallest obstacle and they fall down and they don't want to get up but I, I watch your shows and the ability that you have to be able to just there's this energy but it's more like there's this spirit about you that just it makes people want to listen yeah well you know it's funny because I, I do a daily live show and today i inter- interviewed somebody who was born uh, to a mother who was addicted to crack cocaine and I said to him, I said, well, did you ever have any struggle with addiction? He was like, no. And he, and, and he had he was raised with the belief that, that you could overcome anything. That didn't mean that life wasn't going to be challenging or difficult. But I think of, you know, whatever happened to me that was difficult, I know there's so many people that I just always think about the other people that have it so much worse, you know. And, and I think that you know, when I see, I get inspired by people, like, for example, there's a gentleman who I actually heard speak, and I'm not gonna be able to pronounce his last name, but Nick, and he was born without arms and legs. And he's a motivational speaker now. And so whenever I really start to feel sorry for myself, and I've had some things happen that were tragic and unfortunate and difficult. But I always think that, you know, 
I'm still, you know, my mom always said any day you're above ground is a good day. And so as long as I, you know, I have so much to be thankful for, and it doesn't mean that things aren't difficult, but I know that so many people have it worse. And, and I see people like him, that the people that have created just incredibly meaningful, inspiring lives, despite what would other people would look at as difficulties or disabilities. And I think it's really possible. And I think it really starts with a lot, you know, you have to be grateful. You really do because, uh, there's, there's just always something to be grateful for, you know. Let me let me ask you, you know, even and, you know, I, I, I read your story and I was so moved by it. Even in my own life, there were so many tragedies I went through and so many hardships for the people watching out there. And I know that so many of those people are going to say, look, you know, I'm really in a bad spot. You know, things have just not been going my way. What could you say to them to help them? I say take a deep breath because if you can breathe, there's hope. Honestly, I, I believe that. And it, and this is where I think, you know, and again, you don't have to necessarily take a course or see a doctor, but some degree of mindfulness really, really helps. And I've taken the training a couple of times at UCLA. And the idea is, is if, if you're living in the present moment, obviously, you know, if you're there are things that can be painful in the present moment, but for the most part, most people's pain is caused by worrying about something that hasn't happened yet or thinking about something that's already happened. And I have a tendency to do that. You know, it's funny because my husband is always living in the past and I'm always worried about the future. And I remember the lady that married us 26 years ago said, there's nobody here in the present to have the marriage. But if you really take the present moment, probably right now, not things are not bad right now, you know, and and so I, I think that, that learning some mindfulness, and again, there's free courses online. There's a whole course called Palouse Mindfulness that people can take for free. You don't have to go to some university or, or place to teach it. I think that really helps that know that in the present moment, things maybe aren't as bad as you think, you know? So let me ask you, what is a day in the life of Chef AJ like? <laughs> You know, knowing, talking about mindfulness and talking about these things, what do you do in a typical day? What kind of stuff do you eat? You yeah. know, what kind of stuff do you practice? How does that look like? Well, I keep busy. And I, I think for me, and, and I think people are different that way because my husband just thinks I work too much. But for me, keeping busy is really important because when I'm not busy, that's when all the, what I, you know, like the monkey mind and the chatter starts. So I, I, but being doing, being productively busy, you know, doing something that you enjoy if at all possible. And I think that, I think a lot of times when people are unhappy is because they're not doing meaningful work. And by meaningful work, I don't mean like you have to be like a, you know, like saving lives, but something that's meaningful to you, something, it, something that you enjoy. And, you know, when I, when I talk to people, it seems like, when people are not happy with their work, it's even worse when they, than they're, when they're not happy with their relationship, because you can leave your relationship for like eight or 10 hours a day to go to work. But like, it's like most people can't leave their job. Right. And so fine. I think because I can think of times in my life where I really hated my job. And 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 I think doing something that you love is so important. And and if you can't change your job right now, then then find an, another outlet, whether it's a taking a painting class or doing volunteer work. But you you've got to you got to. I mean, you you only have a certain amount of minutes in your life, and so you got to. I think it's important to spend it doing things you love more than doing things you don't love to do. So you know, most people. When they wake up in the morning, they say, ah, you know, I need to work out. I need to meditate. It takes too long. Mm -hmm. What's your routine? Are you one of those people who likes to do it in the morning yes. or do you like it? Yeah. Absolutely. I do not meditate. I have tried for years. And, and that doesn't mean that I don't do things that are mindful and meditative. But that formal kind of, it just didn't work for me. I'm just too anxious of a person. But the first thing I do when I wake up is exercise. If I don't do it first thing, it doesn't get done. I promise you. And for me, what that looks like is I have a spin bike and the spin bike is right by my bed. So it's not like I got to go very far. And, you know, that really helped me, Dr. Hashmi, to get that bike. It, my, my friend who's a psychologist in the plant-based world, Dr. Doug Lyle, he, he ran a cost-benefit analysis and we figured out what it was costing me to join a gym and to have to fight for a parking space and get up at, early in the morning and the time I was spending it's like now there are people that buy exercise equipment and use it as a clothes hanger, but both my husband and I really use this, especially since COVID when the gyms are closed and it's been a godsend because I use the bike as a way to get to do fun stuff. And so what I mean by that is I do not love exercise. I didn't start exercising until about 10 years ago and I don't love it the way some people do, but I realize how it's so 
I think a lot of people that are that are stressed or unhappy or anxious or depressed, you know, they've shown in clinical trials that exercise is effective as anti-anxiety medicine and anti-depression medication, both of which I've been on many years ago. But the thing is you have to do it. Just like the people on the pill, they got to take that pill every day, right, for it to be effective. Well, when Dr. Lyle explained to me that that was my antidepressant, it was like, oh, so I'm not exercising to like lose weight or be, it's like I am doing it for the mental health benefits. And unfortunately, it only lasts about 24 hours. But I, I tell you, when you start your day in that way, it's just, you have a whole nother outlook on your day. And I know it's hard. Like I, I'm very fortunate that I get to work at home. And I say to my husband every day, people that work for other people, like, and, and especially spending time, I don't know how people with children and commutes do it, but there's gotta be a way you got to, maybe you got to give up something else, like a little Facebook or, or something, but what I've learned to do, and so I don't look forward to exercising, but there's a couple things like I call them guilty pleasures. I don't really watch television, but I do have Netflix on my phone. So I might use that time to watch something. I might use that time to play words with friends. So I, it's almost like I, I feel guilty. Like I don't even, not even paying, I'm not being mindful to the exercise, but by linking it with something, something I don't love with something that I really like, I don't mind it so much, but also it's just, it's just become a habit, right? You know, I don't, I don't really necessarily like brushing my teeth, but no matter how tired I am at night, I do, I really do. And it's just, it, you know, if you keep doing it over and over and over, it will become a habit. And again, people don't always love exercise, but the, you can find something you hate the least. That's what I always tell people. And, but, but I think the people that if, if, if it there's a, there's a group of people that do it all the time. Until you are one of those people, you don't know what we're talking about, about the benefits, because it can be hard, especially after a lifetime of act, inactivity to, you know, to get that body moving. There's like energy conservation principle at play. But when you do, I bet you'll you'll see your life change. And again, so for some people, that would be a group exercise class like Zumba or dancing. But it, it, there, there's, there is something that you will probably like if you really think about what you like to do when you were little. Was it riding a bike? Was it jumping on a trampoline? There's got to be something for everybody. Uh, swimming. And if you're in a place where your body you know, where it's difficult, there's people like physical therapists that they, they can help you ease into it. But even in a chair, you know, you know, I remember I had this, this client once, oh, well, I, I can't exercise. I have trigger thumb. And I'm thinking, well, what about your legs? You know, <laughs> do they not move? You know, so, <laughs> so I get it. Cause I, listen, I tried to avoid it for years, but I think, it, I think it really needs to be a non-negotiable because, you know, in our society, I remember when I was in high school, they stopped physical education. I mean, the, it, 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 people don't go outside and play anymore. This is this is how kids play today. So I don't know. You know, I, I have two daughters, and it's really, really difficult to get them off of those phones. I don't know how they got started, but what I did was I actually, um, my older one is eight, and uh, she's just tall enough where she can stand and bike. So she wakes up at 6.30 to work out with me. It's wonderful. She only does 10 minutes. But that 10 minute of father daughter bonding is like the best thing ever for me. That's and, really cool. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, you, you said that, you know, meditation is hard for some people. You're absolutely right. In fact, you know, what the data shows is even if you can't meditate and you exercise, you get exactly the same benefits. And so it's fascinating is, is you know, there's no super bullet, but whatever you can do, wherever you are, however you can. Those are the things that matter. And that's why what I love about you is all of your obstacles that you've faced, you've overcome. And, and when you know people ask you questions, whether it's on YouTube or your shows or so forth, your answers are so simple that it makes you step back and say, well, okay, of course, that, that makes sense. Why am I not doing it? I love that. Yeah. So let me ask you now about, so we got through the morning, you got your workout in, what are some healthy breakfast options? You know, we as people who practice a whole foods plant-based diet, you know, when it comes to breakfast, people always say, I have no idea what to eat. I mean, I eat the same thing every day, so it's very, very simple for me. But I'm really curious for you, what are your thoughts on breakfast? Yeah. What well, kind of foods do you like? I, you know, I think people, most people do eat the same thing every day, whether it's healthy or unhealthy. How many people eat 30 different breakfasts? Not too many. Think about the word breakfast. 
break fast. So I think the best breakfast is the one you eat when you're hungry. And so if you're not, if you wake up at 630 in the morning and you're not hungry till 11, that's breakfast. I don't think people should force themselves to eat because of a a number on the clock. And I understand there's people with jobs and they don't get a break and they're worried, but I have, I have actually solutions for that too. I mean, unless they're like in an, a sterile operating room and they can't bring food in. So I, I like savory breakfasts. And the reason I say that is because I'm somebody that struggled with obesity for over 50 years, eating a lot of sugar and flour and desserts. And I think that a lot of Americans don't really eat breakfast. They eat dessert for breakfast, you know, croissant, cinnamon bun, donut, you know, cup of coffee, sugar, caffeine, flour. And so I find that for me and my husband as well, he doesn't struggle with weight or any of that, but eating a savory breakfast, it just sets the day off right. Because when you activate, at least in my opinion, the sweet tooth early on, even with something healthy like oatmeal and fruit, I find that I I want sugar all day. I learned, and I didn't know this at first, that the people in the blue zones, which are like the longest lived populations, they eat savory breakfasts. Only in America is breakfast dessert. You know, in other parts of the world, breakfast is whatever you had for dinner the night before. It, it doesn't have to be bacon and eggs or, you know, things like that. And so I find that for people that especially struggle with weight, if starting the day in a savory way is a very good thing. So even if you're eating oats, instead of oatmeal with banana and dates and raisins, maybe oatmeal with greens and shiitake mushrooms and sun-dried tomatoes. One of the things that I discovered quite accidentally, but it turned out last year when Dr. Greger published his book, What um, How Not to Diet, is it green vegetables, because I recommend people start their day with vegetables. It doesn't mean just vegetables, but vegetables and something else, is that these compounds called thylakoids, which are present in cruciferous vegetables, apparently have an incredible effect on the ability to block fat, to turn off the hunger switch, to stop cravings. So I recommend a serving of vegetables at every meal, including breakfast, whatever, even if you're going to eat a donut, eat a donut with some kale. But I think that that helps. And, and again, I, I think that this, there's a big, you know, a lot of people are into intermittent fasting these days and, and, you know, there may be health benefits. I don't do it for that reason. I just, I just feel like it's best to eat when you're actually hungry. And I think so many people get in the habit of eating when they're really not hungry because they were taught that breakfast is the most important meal. If you look at that research, it was done by the cereal industry that wanted everybody to eat breakfast. I think it's the only the most important meal if you actually eat something healthy and eat it when you're truly hungry because hunger is the best sauce. You know, I'm, I'm still thinking about kale donuts. <laughs> what, a, what a great concept. <laughs> well, why not? You know, the Esselstons have a kale cake in their book, so why not some kale donuts? They do. They yes. really do, yeah. They do. So, okay, so we got breakfast in. Now, you know, when, when it comes to, you know, people as they're going down their journey and they're trying to lose weight, the, the difficulty that a lot of people face is, is when they have issues in their lives, the only friend sometimes they have is food. Mm-hmm. And the interesting part, and, in, you know, in my field, some of the things that I always hear from my patients is, look, you know, my food never stands me up. My food never yells at me. My food is always there when I need me. So there's this concept of food addiction. Mm-hmm. It's very strong. And I know for you, you have a lot of experience with it and you've counseled a lot of people on it. So I'm really curious to dive into this topic today on food addiction. What is it? What well, do you do about it? Well, what is it? So I would say that it's not the best term for a medical diagnosis because I don't think people like the word addiction or the word addict because I think it conjures up like some guy, you know, like a heroin addict or something like that. And people people don't like that term. So it's not a good term in that you can't really be addicted to food or eating. You would die if you didn't eat. Although people go sometimes 40 days without eating at a supervised water fasting center. It's, it's the addiction to particular foods. And these are foods that are generally high in fat, sugar, and salt. These are processed foods, things with sugar and flour. Could be certain animal products, especially like dairy. But it, you don't get an addiction to a whole food. I always say that nobody goes to arugula anonymous meetings. It's not the problems isn't with whole foods like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. And I would argue that the food is not your friend because if it's making you fat and sick or both, a good friend wouldn't do that to you, would they? So I understand that it can be comforting to eat these foods because these kind of foods produce more dopamine in the brain. You know, dopamine is produced whenever you have a pleasurable experience. Food and sex, for example, produce dopamine. All food, all eating stimulates the production of dopamine in the brain, but these high fat, high calorie foods 
produce more. And people see this is where it becomes like a vicious cycle because if people aren't exercising and they're not doing anything to get those feel good chemicals in their brain, they're going to be driven to have these, you know, good feelings come from, you know, a pill, a bottle, you know, a donut, those kind of things. And that's why exercise, I think, is really, really important if you're struggling with weight or food addictions because you'll start the day with a blast of those feel good chemicals in your brain. So it'll be harder for you to reach for that because it increases your willpower. Number one, daily exercise, especially when done in the morning, it, but it also increases your ability to stick to a healthy eating plan. So they kind of go hand in hand, but I get it because these foods are very affordable. The foods that people are struggling with, they're socially acceptable. They're readily available. The, these are the ultra processed foods, but the more I learn about them, I realize they are not your friend. Even if you have no struggles with weight or addiction, they're completely dysregulating your gut microbiome. This I learned from all the doctors I've interviewed. They're, they're not food, they're drugs, they're science experiments. And so the fact that people call processed foods foods, I think we need to lobby to change that because they're not food. They're not fit for human consumption. You wouldn't give them to your pet. You wouldn't give them, well, I was going to say you wouldn't give them to your small child, but unfortunately people do, but you wouldn't give them to a baby for sure. So th th we have to start looking at what is really food. And to me, food comes from a plant, not manufactured in a plant. And it took me 43 years to understand that because I too was addicted to these foods. And let's face it, they're delicious. But so can eating a healthy diet be after a period of time when you get used to it's called neuroadaptation. At first, this food probably won't taste very good if you're eating a lot of sugar, fat, and salt. But over time, you can enjoy it as much as your regular diet that you're eating now, especially when you see what it does for your brain, for your body. And uh, But it's hard. I, listen, we wouldn't have a 70% obesity rate if this wasn't a difficult problem. Trust me. And it's not just the United States. I hear, I hear Mexico is, is number one now. Yeah. Where, where do you start? So, you know, if you are trying to lose weight and uh -huh. you've gone through a few cycles of up, down, up, down, where where do you start? What are some simple tips to say, you know, no matter where you're at, you know, exercise, I think, is such a beautiful thing. And no matter who you are, where you are, you can do it. What are some other things that you tell your clients, you tell your audience well, the thing I really tell my clients, the ones that are paying me and they're really serious because the average person will not do this and they're going to give me a lot of excuses why it's too hard. Believe it or not, the first thing I tell people is to clean your environment. It doesn't matter what diet you're going on. But the thing is, is if you were an alcoholic and you went to Betty Ford and you were released, would you go back to the same house that had alcohol in it? Would you say, well, oh, but my husband wants to drink, so we have to have it for company. Would you go back to a job as a bartender? I think most people wouldn't, or at least they would know that there, there could be dangers in doing that. It's the same thing with food. See, the problem, Dr. Hashmi, is most people aren't willing to change their lifestyle. People are willing to go on a diet through a great deal of suffering and deprivation for a short period of time to achieve a short-term goal, especially like if they have a wedding or a reunion to go to, or maybe their doctor threatens to put them on medication. The problem with that is if what you're doing isn't sustainable, it won't be permanent. So you have to think about the fact that when you change your lifestyle permanently, the weight comes off as a result of trying to get healthy. And so I tell people that they have, they need to clean their environment because this is something I listen. I, when I was obese 10 years ago and I went to the true North health center, one of the first things that Dr. Doug Lyle, the psychologist said there, and I remember writing it down on a pad, he said, we must work harder on our environment than we do ourselves. So whatever those problematic foods are, it's not like you say, well, I'm never going to have chips again or French fries or Coke. You might, I don't know, but you don't want it in your house. You want to make it difficult to do the wrong thing and easy to do the right thing. And yes, there are people that are so addicted to food that if in a clean environment, they will drive to 7-Eleven at midnight. But most people won't because when most people are tired, especially if they're living somewhere where it's snowy and cold, most people won't. And I, I remember I recently just interviewed Dr. Greger for the Truth About Weight Loss Summit. And he, go, he talked about the importance of the environment because if you have a clean environment, not an empty environment, not Mother Hubbard with bare cupboards. But if you have an environment that's, that does not have any non-compliant food, whatever that is for your plan, and it's full of healthy food that's already prepared, guess what? When you're hungry, you'll eat it. Your kids will eat it. People say, oh, well, my kid's so picky. Your kid is only picky because you fed them crap and because you give them a choice. Now, sure, there's going to be some 
kids on the spectrum. There's a few kids where it's not possible, but every pediatrician I've interviewed said a child will not starve themselves to death. And when you offer them something after dinner because they didn't eat their dinner, you're just reinforcing that. And so, so again, it, 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 a clean environment goes a long way to solving this problem because it, it, you're genetically hardwired to prefer the most concentrated source of calories for survival. That's that's just your brain. It's nothing. The fact that you love all this rich crap, there's not, that means your your brain is working the way nature intended. So whenever there's rich food in the environment, remember the environment is when, wherever you are. So when you're at work, that's your environment. When you're on vacation, that's your environment. And but you ha- you can't control every environment, obviously. And and it'd be impossible. You go to the pet store these days to buy a leash, and there's candy at the register. Last time I checked, no dogs ate chocolate. It's toxic to dogs. Hardware store, candy at the register. Michael's craft store, candy at the register. Joanne's fabric, candy at the register. The hospital that I used to volunteer at before COVID. Not only candy at the gift shop and in the in the cafeteria, but vending machine in the parking lot because we all know we can't walk from our car to the front desk without a you know without a Red Bull. You know, so the the thing is, you're not going to be able to control those environments, but you can control what's in your house. And I already hear people saying, "Well, I can't because my kids and my husband like this food." Well, it's not good for them whether they're not overweight or not. But you have to come to some kind of agreement or negotiation where at least you don't interact with those foods. And what some people do is they get locked food safes, they get separate refrigerators. A lot of times the husband and the children, or it could be the wife, it seems to be, it's usually the husband, is just as addicted to these foods either. They're addicts too, whether they admit it or not. I've been told by health professionals that a truly loving family member will support someone in recovery. So you have to work hard on negotiating a clean environment because willpower is only going to get you so far on your diet. The minute you have a car accident, a bad day at work, somebody somebody gets sick, you're going to eat it. And I, 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 one of my favorite stories from a client named Melanie. And I remember, cause when I did this program in LA, I, I'm, all my work is online, but I used to do in-person programs. And I used to actually go to the house and do an inspection, right? At least for the period of the three weeks of the program, they had to either throw everything out or put it in a trash bag, let me take it out. And I remember she had some seized candy. And I said, what is this? She goes, oh, it's my husband's. I go, well, this can't be in the house. And she goes, well, don't worry. I don't like that flavor. And plus it's dark chocolate. I don't like dark chocolate, only milk chocolate. Well, guess what happened? There was a bad day. I remember her dog got really, really sick, was diagnosed with cancer. She ate it all. She didn't like the flavor. Doesn't matter. You get just as much dopamine from a flavor you don't like as from a flavor you do like. It cannot be in the house. I have a saying, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. It's not a question of if you will eat it when, but that's, that's the best I got. A clean environment goes a long way. Trust me. You know, when I used to be a personal trainer, I remember one of the things I would always tell my clients is if you're starting exercise, you want to make things as easy as possible. Get your shoes right next to your bed, get everything ready. So when you wake up, there's no excuses. And on the opposite front is exactly what you talk about. The stuff that you're trying to change, make it so it's harder to get to. The harder it is to get to, the more you have to go through those steps. And that's where your willpower to go after that stuff will actually wear yourself out. That's fascinating. Right. So. Well, it's, it's like you want the easy, cho- the, the, the healthy choice to be the easy choice and the unhealthy choice to be the difficult choice. But now we live in a world where it's the opposite. The unhealthy choice is on every single corner with a fast food restaurant or a 7-Eleven. And, you know, you think with the pandemic, a lot of people actually did well because they weren't eating at restaurants. But then they found that the restaurants were delivering right to their house, which kind of made it even worse. And, and the thing I have to mention is it's not just a question of cleaning the environment so it's bare. You've got to put the healthy food in. And it's got to be ready. You can't just have a whole bunch of vegetables in your refrigerator. You got to have them cut up for a salad. And the thing with kids is kids are just as lazy as grownups. And I have seen kids with with parents like they'll put a fruit uh, like fruit on the counter and the kid won't eat it. But if the parent goes the extra mile and takes one of those things and cuts the apple and then puts it out. And especially if there's like a dip, you know, the kid will eat it because we're, we're just basically, you know, big kids. You know, a kid may not munch on a carrot, but you buy, get baby organic carrots and have some hummus or guacamole. All of a sudden they'll eat it. Kids like small things and they like things that they can dip. So, yeah. So you have so many fantastic recipes mm. for people watching this. What would you say? Where's the best place for them to 
start on their journey to making healthier foods. Well, have a, yeah, I have a YouTube channel. Not all of it. Now it's a lot of interviews, so that so it's a little bit harder to find some of the recipes. But there's there there all are a lot. But like I said, I have lots of those free on YouTube and books. The thing is, is I like to teach people eventually that they don't need recipes. They need ingredients and they need spices that they love and ingredients that they love. So I think one of the best ways for people to eat, and people have called this monk bowls, Buddha bowls, but but if you think of this idea of a bowl, we have restaurants now, and they've probably existed before, but I never paid attention to them. They're called poke bowl or poke bowl restaurants. And and the idea is, is you customize it with the ingredients you love. So there might be 20 different vegetables and six different kinds of fruits and three different kinds of grains and 10 different kinds of greens. And as you order, you take what you want. And I think eating that way at home, it's one of the cheapest and most delicious and most versatile because then, you know, you got this one kid, well, I don't like green peas and I don't like, you know, red bell pepper. The idea is to have ingredients. So you have a bowl or it could be a plate, but things seem to stay better in a bowl and you cook up a bunch of starch and that could be any kind of grain, quinoa, brown rice, uh, oat groats, uh, you know, whatever you like. And, and it could be beans. It could be a combination. I recommend people doing both. And then you have a wide variety of fruits and vegetables, fresh herbs, and, and then different different kind of either salad dressings or sauces. I use something called California balsamic vinegar that comes in a bunch of different flavors. And then pe- and potatoes, by the way, potatoes can be the base. Potatoes are sweet potatoes, stuffed potato meal where people can put in some corn, some beans, corn and beans, salsa, guacamole, Kids especially love, it's kind of like the idea of a salad bar, but with more than just lettuces and vegetables, we're talking a starch and and it can be so delicious. You know, at one point a while back, Whole Foods actually had this in one of their stores and it was my favorite place to eat because I could pick cubed butternut squashes and my husband could pick tofu. And it was so fun because it never was the same way twice. Wow. That's fascinating. You know, and and that's, that's why listening to you is so amazing is you take complex concepts and you make it so simple yeah. and that's stuff that people can go home and do right now you know I, okay so i used to live next door to trader joe's for most of my life in los angeles and now i live 20 minutes away from a trader joe's so i can't just walk there every day like i used to but for example Okay, so one of the meals that I make, like when I'm sometimes I'm just really in a hurry and I'm just looking for calories on, and, and yet it's it's really actually quite delicious is Trader Joe's sells organic rice and quinoa in little bags that go in the freezer. They take three minutes to microwave. Trader Joe's also sells broccoli, which happens to be my favorite vegetable, organic in a 12 ounce bag that takes four minutes to microwave. I use something called a Pampered Chef steamer. So three minutes plus four minutes is seven minutes. It's like, oh, rice and broccoli. Well, yeah, not so great. But then what I do is I take some green onions, which I always have and cut them up. And now it's a little better. And I take about a quarter cup of golden raisins and a little bit of California balsamic curry vinegar. And now I've got like this curried broccoli rice that it's actually really good. And I, I look forward to it, but it took me seven minutes to make, you know, so it doesn't have to be complicated. The problem isn't so much the cost or the amount of time. The problem is, is because I really believe that people are so addicted to sugar, fat, and salt that the kind of simple meals that I'm recommending to people, they don't taste good at first. And that's the biggest challenge. That's why some people go to a place like the Fasting Escape or the True North Health Center, and they do what's called a medically supervised water fast. It just doesn't mean they're fasting for people that are really sick for 40 days, but sometimes they'll fast for three days or maybe a week. But what happens is it like it resensitizes your taste nerves. And so that when you, because you're not having sugar, fat, and salt, you're not having any food, so that when they start refeeding you something like steamed zucchini, it tastes amazing. And that's the problem is that the people have eaten so much junk for so long that this healthy, whole natural food doesn't taste good. I didn't eat fruit until I was 43 because it's like, who would eat a strawberry? Ugh, it's not sweet. But now sometimes there's certain fruit, like for example, there's an apple called the Envy Apple that they sell. And it's like, oh, this is like too, almost too sweet for me now. Sometimes fruit is just really too sweet. So that's the thing about this process of neuroadaptation. It's hard for people, especially if they're in an unclean environment, everybody else is eating crap for for this kind of food to taste good. So if you need to use a little salt at the beginning, if you need to use some richer, don't use oil, but you could use like more high fat foods like avocado, like peanut sauces that are plant-based made from the whole fat instead of the oil. So there's, there's ways to kind of transition uh, you know, more slowly for people. But, but the thing is, is 
look, let me put it this way. Dr. Joel Furman, for example, never been overweight. We eat pretty close to the same. If it was punishment, do you think people like him or Dr. Alan Goldhammer could be doing this for 40 years? I promise you, it may not look like it to you right now, but we get as much pleasure from our food as you do. Maybe we get more because we're actually eating food that loves us back, that nourishes us, body, mind, and spirit. It didn't taste good at first, of course. You can't go from Coke Slurpees to kale. I mean, you can, but it takes some transitioning. And and, and that's that's the thing. People, they want results fast rather than results that will last. And there is going to be a period of time that you're not going to love the food. You may not like it. But the more you do it, the more you will like it. And then when you see how you look and feel, you're going to end up loving it. We, nobody could do it if, if if it wasn't sustainable, but it is. And and also, you know, think about it. I don't know anybody that doesn't like potatoes or sweet potatoes, one or the other. And there's machines now, like they're called air fryers. And you can take a sweet potato or a potato and you put in this machine and you've got like French fries that are better than the soggy salty ones you get at, at other places and they're crisp and, and I don't know anybody that doesn't like air fries and you can dip them in barbecue sauce or whatever you want. There is way to make healthy food delicious. That's why when we were having conferences back in the day, they were so beneficial because the food was prepared the way we recommend and people could say, hey, this is like like the McDougal problems, like, hey, this is really good, you know? Uh, so yeah, it just takes a while for people to get used to the taste if they're not used to it. So I got to make a confession. I have an air fryer, and the only reason I got it is sweet potato fries is my weakness. Oh, they're the best. Oh, it's just so good. And, it's and, you so know, good. I have a little little tool that was sixty nine dollars, where it cuts them in the perfect fry shape. Wow. Yeah, it's so it because I I don't have a very good good cutting skills. I but, still yeah. have a knife. Oh yeah, no knife is great if you sweet potatoes can be tough though sometimes you know. Yeah. You want to know a great, you want to not try, okay, my grandmother had this word for food. She called it a taste thrill. So, and I discovered this once when I was flying. And when, when you fly, your food sometimes just gets weird at high altitude. Bananas go bad and potatoes get all mushy. So I came back and like my sweet potato, which was cooked, was just, it was not looking so good. And I thought, ah, I can't throw it away. I put it in the fridge. I'm like, what would happen if I put it in the air fryer? And I discovered, and I don't really understand this thing about resistant starch that increases when you chilled cooked potatoes, but take your potato, whatever it is. I find this is really delicious with the Hana yam or the Japanese sweet potato. You cook it. Generally, I roast it because roasting it, uh, brings out more of the natural sugars than steaming or microwaving. Then I chill it. And then the next day I slice it in half and then I take my hand and I press it down. So I call it sweet potato toast. And then I air fry it and it's like mind blowing. I mean, it's so good. It's wow. it, it's so good. And I think I have a recipe for that on YouTube. I call it sweet potato toast. And you just press it after it's been chilled and it firmed up. And then you air fry it like 400 for 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the size. And it's so crispy. It almost tastes like marshmallows. It's so good. I'm not kidding you. You know, the first thing I'm going to do after this interview yeah. is find you. <laughs> Let me know how you like that's, that's literally the first thing so I'm, good. I'm taking and, notes. And, and, and you know, sometimes I'll dip it in like I had like the other day I had red lentil chili and I did and even though it was sweet, a sweet I dipped it in that. I was using that like as my spoon because it was like it was like a long one. I'm like, this is good stuff. But air fryers are great. And air fryers are great for people that hate vegetables too, because when you roast vegetables, it doesn't, you don't necessarily need an air fryer, but just roasting vegetables brings out again the natural sugars, the caramelization, and they make them more palatable that, than just you know steaming or microwaving them or putting a, a marinade on them like if people think oh i can't have without oil no you can take balsamic vinegar and mustard and coat them and then air fry them or roast them and they're really good it, but you, you really the sooner you'll learn to love vegetables the easier this will be i promise wow i i, I am truly fascinated and excited <laughs> all right so i'm going to ask you a little bit of a difficult topic question uh -oh. and and the reason is is you know, I get a lot of patients who come to me and they have severe kidney disease and I talk to them about, you know, changing their lifestyle and we start with the nutrition portion and we talk about how powerful a plant-based diet is when it comes to kidney disease. But they always tell me, well, you know, ah, that, that sounds really tough and, you know, I'm going to make one small change. And then I say, okay, you know, this is what I need. Fine. Three months later, they come back and they say, yeah, you know, I, I cut down from eating meat you know, 12 times a week to 11 times a week. And so I'm sitting there and the, the difficulty that I have 
is having done this now since 2000, the issues I run into, I can predict what's going to happen to them. And the saddest part is, is I've had people on their deathbed in the hospital where they've said to me, you know, doc, I should have listened to you. I've never had a patient on their deathbed say, oh, you know, I was right. And doc, you were totally wrong. Every single one of them that's ever talked to me has always said, I wish I listened to you. And this concept of, you know, moderation and trying to slow things down, it's an interesting fallacy that we come up with. But, you know, it hurts me because when I see all my patients suffer and I know they have to make significant changes, but they there's this concept that if I just make a small change, that's good enough. What do you think about this concept of moderation? I think it's a lie. And I think Dr. Russellson calls it the myth of moderation. Moderation it does not work in the world. If we if it did, we wouldn't have the obesity population. It, the thing is, is if you could have been moderate, you would have been moderate and you wouldn't have had this disease. There are people probably that can drink alcohol moderately and they are the people that we don't call alcoholics. But when you're an alcoholic, you can't drink moderately. I think that when somebody has an addiction, the only thing that works is abstinence. And I think that sometimes small changes incrementally done over time can lead to positive effects. But but for example, for the person cutting meat from 12 to 11 times, that's like somebody diagnosed with lung cancer going from four packs a day to three packs a day. Once you have a diagnosable disease like that, I don't think moderation will work for you anymore. And I, that's how it, you know that the addiction is so strong that people cannot change their behavior. You know, maybe if you had a patient that actually did listen to you and recover, that would be the one to talk to the patient, you know, because it's like, you know, like when you hear from the doctors, like, well, what does he know? He's healthy, you know, but hearing it from somebody that was in their shoes and said, hey, I was on death's door and I listened to Dr. Hashmi and now I'm not on dialysis or, or what, you know, I've, I've known people in with stage four kidney disease that, that have, they're better now. Like their doctor's like, well, I don't know what you did, but keep doing it. So there is hope and there's possibility, but it's it's hard because it's an addiction. A food is an addiction for some. If it wasn't, then why wouldn't they do it? I bet you if you told that patient, listen, stop eating okra, you're going to be fine. They could do that. 100 percent. You know, it's a it's a fascinating phenomenon. And, and, you know, it's it's so hard because just like, you know, you, you deal with your clients. I get to know my patients. They, they become a part of my family. And as I see them go down and then the day comes where I have to say goodbye to them, it's it's heartbreaking. And the hardest thing is, you know, I, one of the things I never want to be invited to is funerals. And when I do get invited to it, it is so hard for me to go. It well, it's got to be hard knowing that, it, that this is largely preventable, you know, and it's mostly reversible. This, yeah. it, it, we live in a world that does not understand that food is medicine and that most doctors, unless they've gone to some lengths like you or Dr. Lawenda, get almost no medical school training in nutrition. And, and people just don't understand this concept that food is the most powerful medicine or the most powerful poison. And they don't see it that way. It's the culture. Well, you know, you got, you know, got to have protein, meat, you know, you know, meat is, you know, it's, it's just, unless they've learned it from somewhere or maybe seen a movie like Game Changers or Forks Over Knives, or it has somebody in their family that's one of us crazy vegans, they're not even exposed to this message. It's so true. It's so true. You know, I recommend Forks Over Knives to so many people simply because I feel like it's one of the best way for us to be able to get that message across. Sometimes as physicians talking, it's hard, you know, there, there's not that relatability that, you know, somehow they look at you and say, you're not the average person. But we are, we all have these struggles we go through in life. So let me ask you to kind of bring all of this stuff together. And this has been such a fascinating interview today. But if you had to say three things, and this is putting you on the spot, but because I, I admire you so much and I, I value your opinion. What would you say are the three most important takeaways that people listening today should really say, you know, these are the three things that I got to start with? Hmm. You have to pick three, because you got like three million. I well, I, you know, it's funny. The first thing that came to my mind is be kind to animals. And when you're kind to animals, you don't eat them, number one, right? You don't eat their secretions like their milk and you don't eat their menstrual cycle like their eggs. So honestly, being kind to animals, that goes a long way just in general. I mean, be kind to people too, but in general, we don't have a problem with people eating people, at least that I know of, thank goodness, right? Eat more vegetables. Just 
you know, even if you can't be 100 percent, instead of thinking about deprivation, what you have to give up, just find a way to eat vegetables. Even if it's a green smoothie, I don't care at the beginning. You've got to get the green in somehow. That's going to make it so much better. It's going to dilute the overall caloric density of your meals. It's going to give you the phytonutrients you need. It's going to make your skin look beautiful. It's going to help if you have heart disease, you know, produce the nitric oxide. Just find ways to eat vegetables. And here's the thing. If you don't like it, it doesn't matter. You're a grown up. You don't have to like it. You just have to do it. That's what I always say to myself every morning when it's like, I'm cold. And in the, in the morning, it's really cold. Like, do I really want to get out of bed and spin? And then I hear the voice of John Pierre, the trainer saying, look, you're an adult. You don't have to like it. You just have to do it. The thing is, is if you do it, you will feel so much better. And then the third thing is just give yourself the gift of a clean environment. Find a way to, if you, if, if you listen, if you live alone, there's no excuse. If you live alone, I'm sorry, there's no excuse. But if you live with other people, find a way to negotiate that, you know, just say, you know, for my birthday, for Christmas, what I want is three weeks of a clean environment. And again, having, what people don't understand is having a clean environment doesn't mean that they can't go out and eat the crap. They just can't eat it in front of you. That's all. So that's what I would say and see how it goes or just try it for, for three weeks. See how you feel. I love it. I love it. Once again, simple, effective, and easily doable. So the best way to find you would be your YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, because I go live. Well, I don't. I can't promise it'll be forever. My goal is to do it every day for a year. But I go live every day at 11 a.m. Pacific time on YouTube. And we have interesting guests. We've had Dr. Hashmi on. We've got, it's not always a doctor. Sometimes it's a chef doing a cooking demo or it could be just an, you know, an interesting, I try, my, my thing is, is people that are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. So um, I actually interviewed, she wasn't vegan, but she was one of my favorite guests, the wife of Jack LaLanne, Elaine LaLanne, 97 years old. She gets up and lifts weights every day. So she doesn't have an excuse. She's 97 or maybe she's 94. But anyway, the point is, is I don't even do that, you know? That's amazing. And I'll put the links for the YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. I also know you have some books. I saw them on Amazon. Yeah. If you mention this, one is, uh, this is my Amy. second book. This is if people are trying to lose weight. This great recipes. But this one, which actually was written by Glenn Merzer, I did the recipes for because these are these are really easy recipes, really easy one. And then unprocessed, it's in the other room. Fantastic. I'll put the links to them. And I gotta tell you, you know, I'm in awe. Thank well, you. Thank you. No, thank you, man. I, love, I think it's great what you guys are doing. I mean, if anybody's going to get it, it's going to be Kaiser for sure, you know, because they, they because that's the model that we need. Let's be, you know, let's be proactive instead of, you know, that's the way we to do it. All the time. Yes. yes, that's right. I'm proactivity. That's proactive. <laughs> Awesome, as always. Thank you for the amazing work you're doing. I see the comments on YouTube and I'm like, wow, mm. you are touching so many lives every single day. So please, instead of a year, make it two. You well, know, you know, I might not, I might not be able to keep up the seven day a week schedule, but I definitely want to continue it because there's so many people left that, that still want to be interviewed and, and they always, the guests always want to come back. So it's, it's been really rewarding. Well, we are delighted to have you. We can't wait to have you back on again. Thank you. And just bless you and for all the work you're doing. You know, I, my wife and I are big believers in karma and uh, I truly believe what you put out there, you get back. So what you put out there is outstanding and I'm sure it's all coming back to you and it will continue to come back to you. Oh, that is so kind. Thank you, Dr. Hashmi. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Self Principle Podcast with Dr. Sean Hashmi. Sign up for our newsletter at selfprincipal.org forward slash newsletter to never miss out on any of our latest health and wellness tips. We'd love for you to visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash selfprincipal, where you can find past interviews and more great content to help you live your best life. Until the next episode, remember, the secret to a healthy, happy life is in sleeping more, moving more, practicing gratitude and kindness, and eating a whole foods plant-based diet.